Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. As you could hear, I am not, I'm neither a scholar of Jewish studies nor even a scholar of religion. I'm a professor of German literature, but it so happens that via many detours, I have dealt with the reception of aspects of scriptures and uh, the Jewish approach to scriptures in uh, 20th and 21st century um, literature, but mainly thought, philosophy, theory. Uh, my last book uh, deals primarily with this. It's called German Jewish Thought and Its Afterlife, a tenuous legacy, which means a fragile legacy, because I am indeed dealing with, uh, so my larger argument is that among contemporary thinkers, uh, this particular tradition, but mainly the Jewish dimension of this tradition uh, is being appropriated, distorted, or rejected altogether. And you mentioned George R. Gamben before, he's just one of the examples. And I have chosen here in the title of my uh, talk um, two figures, in many ways extreme opposites, uh, who uh, because, uh, opposites in terms of time. Margarete Zussmann is the first reception of Franz Kafka and uh, Slavoj Žižek, one of the very recent ones. You see also in terms of content, they're very, uh, very, very far apart, and yet there is a, a common element to it, which I hope I can explain. So uh, in some ways I'm twice removed from the core stuff because already Kafka is or at least seem somewhat removed, but I've tried to show also in my book about other figures, and the figures, some of the figures you have mentioned, that uh, there is more of a Jewish dimension to these thinkers if one uh, looks closely and if one wants to look, uh, then uh, one would think. And uh, one, one of the ways of experiencing this Jewish dimension is if you look at how they're being read by people who want to reject this dimension, then you realize uh, how it is there in the first place. So, one of the most common accusations against biblical scriptures in modernity is that they are tools for theodicy, designed to support a justification of the divine order at all costs and against all evidence. The biblical book of Job has traditionally been read as such a decisive theodicy. The figure of Job, Eov, regarded as the embodiment of the sufferer, indeed represents the greatest challenge to the simultaneity of divine omnipotence and divine goodness. Job's suffering, his complaints and accusations against God, and his ultimate submission before the demonstration of divine glory at the end of the book of Job, have been read as the definitive justification of divine power. The writings of Kafka, on the other hand, embody a resistance against such justifications. So at least that is how one has read Kafka. It is therefore striking that Kafka, although he never mentions Job, has been read so often in relation to this biblical figure. And I've cut out here the examples. There are page-long examples of uh, critics, thinkers, who have associated Kafka and Eov, and Kafka indeed never mentions Job. In my talk, I will juxtapose an early Jewish, or at least Jewish authored, and a contemporary Christian interpretation of the juncture between Kafka and the book of Job. And I will contrast both with an attempt to imagine Kafka himself as a reader of the scriptural text. Imagine, but not quite, as one would say in German, aus der Luft gegriffen. Not quite, I hope. In recent decades, Critics have convincingly noted similarities between Kafka's work and the book of Job. Harold Fish, echoing many other critics, noted that the analogy with Job has even become a commonplace of Kafka criticism. The book of Job's hermeneutic difficulties can indeed contribute to making it an illuminating companion to Kafka's work, especially when we consider its deeply paradoxical nature. The book of Job yields no clear moral or message. First and foremost, the Job question can in itself be regarded as a paradox. If there is no justice in the world, since the righteous and the sinners suffer alike, how can we claim that God is both just and almighty? <clears throat> Yet there are other more specific paradoxes inherent here. Unlike 
Job's friends and supposed comforters who justify the ways of God and variously explain the existence of evil as punishment, didactic ordeal or trial. Job rebe rebels against God. Job accuses God of injustice, indifference, withdrawal from human reach, and yet Job does so in a most direct and intimate address that confirms God's closeness. A related paradox is God's surprising response. Despite Job's rebelliousness, God praises his attitude and rejects the friend's words as empty flattery. Finally, the resolution of the dialogue between God and Job remains puzzling. In his speech from the whirlwind, God gives a most indirect, if not unsatisfactory, reply to Job's accusations, yet in the end, Job nevertheless submits to God in dust and ashes. And there are more. These are just some of the paradoxes and in their interpretations invariably, albeit in different ways. Uh, thinkers offer highly selective readings of the book of Job by aiming to resolve these paradoxes and to project the resulting solutions onto Kafka's work. The book of Job and Kafka's writings are consequently divested of a certain resistance to closure and become illustrations of external theological constructs. So what I criticize here is they don't perform what you have described as hermeneutics. Um, but I think this will become clearer. Margarete Zussmann's essay, The Joe Problem in Kafka, offers the best example. Published in 1929, it is among the earliest German studies of Kafka. It offers a philosophical portrait of the Prague author within a Jobian understanding of the fate and mission of the Jewish people. Zussmann takes Kafka as the representative of the Jobin experience in modernity. In Kafka's time, Job's plight, his suffering, his desperate hope to be heard, have become even more acute. Thus, any understanding of the connection between guilt and suffering, problematized in the book of Job, is now entirely beyond the grasp of modern man. Life has become empty of any weight or meaning, and Kafka's artistic achievements, so Zussmann, is the form of this nothing itself. And yet, there is something hidden, an almighty law that permeates everything, and Kafka's word, work envisions a world that is truly abandoned by God, and precisely therefore, that is how it is revealed. So God exists, it's real negative theology, pure, where it is the absence of God that is God's last way of being present in modernity. Susan's interpretation of Kafka first amplifies and then resolves the central paradoxes uh, in the book of Job and in Kafka. Kafka becomes a representative of the Jews elected by God in spite of his rendering of a world from which justice has vanished. So along with God's disappearance, justice has also disappeared and all this is actually an affirmation. So you get this radical dialectic reversal. The more absent both God and justice, the more it is really present and Kafka makes us feel. There are certain reasons why one can read Kafka like that. The castle, the uh, trial, all these are manifestations of an uh, immense absence. Mm -hmm. It is a possibility of reading Kafka like that, but I think that there are some problems that one can point out uh, with Zussmann. There are other ways of reading Kafka. I'll come back to that when I uh, propose how one can read Kafka's Job, of whom he never wrote. So it is for Zussmann, not Job the rebel, but Job the martyr, who has taken all the suffering of the world upon him, who is really, so the suffering, also the suffering of the absence of God, and he thereby is both a precursor of Christ and a precursor of Kafka. Kafka is the one who takes, so there is a kind of line that is being drawn from uh, Eov to Christ and Kafka for modernity. Okay, Slavoj Žižek, the Slovenian philosopher and cultural critic associated with the New Paulines. These are, is a group of thinkers who I've uh, paid particular attention in my book. There are those who invoke uh, the Apostle Paul in recent uh, years and decades, among them Alain Badiou and uh, uh, <coughs> precisely Giorgio Agamben uh, and others, 
who uh, invoke Paul as the model for a, a kind of Christian anarchism that is there to overthrow the oppressive state law and along with, and so Paul's rejection of Jewish law uh, is a kind of model for a contemporary rejection of, uh, of yeah, democratic laws that are oppressing our society. Um, chronologically, but even more so ideologi ideo ideologically, Zizek's readings seems to stand in opposite pole of Sussman's Kafka reception. Zizek gives a decidedly new twist to old supersessionist beliefs. The true core of Christianity is namely revolutionary. Christ's death on the cross reveals God's powerlessness, whereas Judaism holds on to its old legalistic beliefs and legitimizes divine sovereignty against all odds, including its own uh, uh, awareness of God's uh, impotence. So his argument is that basically uh, the Jews knew all along, since Job at least, that God is not omnipotent. But the Jews pretended that this was not the case because they wanted to keep their faith. And it's Christians, the key, to, so, okay. The revelation is the Christian breakthrough itself. His interpretation of, so Zizek's interpretation of the monotheistic tradition informs his reading of the book of Job. The key to Christ, Zizek writes, is provided by the figure of Job, whose suffering prefigures that of Christ. For Zizek, the almost unbearable impact of the book of Job resides not so much in its narrative frame, but in its final outcome. This outcome is the effect of God's speech from the whirlwind, which Zizek describes as, quote, empty boasting, and in typically irreverent fashion as a, quote, kind of cheap Hollywood horror show with lots of special effects. So the Leviathan and all that are his, the special effects of God's um, show. Uh, the Book of Job, Zizek writes, in, uh, provides what is perhaps the first exemplary case of the critique of ideology in human history laying bare the basic discursive strategies of legitimizing suffering, Job's properly ethical dignity resides in ways he persistently rejects the notion. Now, Zizek's reading of the book of Job attempts a questionable reversal of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. It is now Judaism that holds on to a theodicy, whereas Christianity discloses it as a lie. Like Job, Christ on the cross laments that God does not come to his rescue, However, since Christ is ultimately part of God himself, his suffering, along with his why hast thou forsaken me, is a revolutionary act. It signifies like a, a kind of revolution against himself. If Job is for Zizek a precursor of Christ, and the book of Job a radical unmasking of divine authority, Kafka is one of Job's successors. And his, so here, there are two completely radically opposed uh, figures with radically opposed ideologies who meet in this uh, sequence of Job, Christ, and Kafka. Against Zuzman and Zizek, and that's my final part, I'd like to argue that Kafka is neither, uh, yes, there is uh, maybe just, just that. He praises Kafka, Zizek praises Kafka for re having reintroduced into a uh, religion, no, it's thanks to his Jewish background that he had the idea of reintroducing vitality into the dead letter of the law. Now, where does he find that in Kafka? Because Kafka's judges, their law books are pornographic leaflets. It turns out that they are pornographic leaflets. And Zizek praises that for having reintroduced vitality into the dead letter. So, coming from Paul as the dead letter, that's where the, so the vitality resides in the pornography. Uh, okay. Against Zussmann and Zizek, I will argue that Kafka is neither the submissive martyr of an absent God, nor an antinomian blasphemer unmasking an impotent show, uh, show of pseudo-sovereign. To understand how Kafka would have read the book of Job, I want to turn to the remarks by Kafka on another figure. 
and that's a famous little text under, uh, for, among other reasons, because Derrida has worked on that text by Kafka. It's his reading of Abraham, of the story of the Akeda. But I'm not reading the part that Derrida reads, because there is one part that he leaves out that I find more interesting. Kafka imagines, so there is a little text that he wrote in a letter that starts with, I can imagine another Abraham. And this is really written against uh, Kierkegaard, uh, for, whom, uh, for whom Abraham's obedience to God is the infinite resignation that is the last stage before faith. So he's, for him, Abraham is a knight of faith. Kafka imagines another Abraham. Abraham. And it's, he is not exact, so he's, uh, it's an Abraham who says, yes, he says to God, I would very much like to be a, a faithful servant and now go and sacrifice my son uh, on Mount Moriah. However, so it, in, with full of humor, Kafka writes, to be sure, this Abraham wouldn't quite make it all the way to patriarch. But like the biblical patriarch, he wants to obey. However, Kafka describes then two scenes, and I'm only to shorten this, deal with one. Abraham tells God, you know, I would very much like to obey, but I am needed here. My house isn't finished. There's all the time one more thing I have to do. So right now, I just cannot possibly leave my house. Um, in the next sentence, Kafka says, Kafka writes, these other Abrahams, it becomes a, a type, it becomes a certain kind of reasoning. The, these other Abrahams, they stand on their building sites and suddenly they have to go up to, to Mount Moria. Mm -hmm. These Abrahams, as imagined by Kafka, are called by God while they are attending to their lives and caring for their lives. The divine injunction reaches them when they are in the midst of their home, their house, and their world building. As much as Kafka's other Abrahams would otherwise have been willing to oblige, they are immersed in the care of their building site. These Abrahams, Kafka continues, are standing in the middle of their building site, building houses that on purpose this is a quote, on purpose. There are kinds of houses that can never be finished, so they don't have to look up, lift their eyes, and see the mount mm -hmm. that is in the distance. There is no negation that this mount is in the distance. And Kafka describes a certain Abrahamic figure who says that what he's I mean, you can read even Kafka's own works, and I'm making a parallel that I'm skipping here, a parallel with Kafka's own infinite, that there's an infinite aspect to Kafka's own writings. And that kind of infinity, there's an awareness that there is a kind of concern with this world, but it could also be the infinity of literature, but it could also be the infinity. So there is a kind of dialogue with, uh, with the divine, uh, there's a dialogue with God who says, you know, I'm, so first of all, the mount is there. I'm busy. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, but, and he, he's saying that, that to God. So Kafka does not pretend to be any kind of, you know, holy man, but there is something. And I think that particularly, and I'm thinking here of the book that I just mentioned that I read uh, by you very many, many years ago when I started uh, my studies. Um, the, uh, what's it in English? The la lecture. In, the I don't know what it is. The infinite, re infinite, infinite reading. reading. La lecture infinie. And it does deal with the, with the, Tal with the idea of the, Tal of the Talmud, Talmudic learning as something that is infinite. And what is the Talmud about? To a very large extent about building this house, about this world, and about dealing with this. So uh, contrary to, to, the, to, to those readings where the, uh, a negative theo uh, theology or even an anarchist uh, anti-theology, there is something here that is much closer to core Jewish preoccupations and ideas. Now, how would Job 
uh, how that would relate to Job? Well, if we take the Eof story, there is something right at the center of it that is uh, that lies in the in in Eof's lament. And what he's lamenting about is finally it's not only his misery; it's it's about the state of the world as such, and the, uh, that is where uh, that connection can lie. I uh, can't demonstrate this in full here, uh, but this is clearly uh, in a yeah goes in a very different direction. Okay. If it's okay, we'll leave the questions for the end. Okay.